Amen. All right. Um, so we're there in Exodus 25, and it's kind of an easy chapter to, to uh, get lost in a little bit. Sometimes all the descriptions, and it kind of gets monotonous as we're reading through it. But uh, what I want to focus on is the Ark, the Ark of the Covenant, or the Ark of God, the Ark of the Tabernacle that it talks about there uh, in verse 10. And there's actually three arks in the Bible. The first is obviously Noah and the ark, right? The, the large vessel or boat, that, the ship that he used, uh, the, two, the animals two by two, and Noah and his family. And then also the Bible talks about the ark uh, that Moses was laid in the river Nile by his mother, right, in, in uh, Exodus chapter 2. Uh, but this is the ark of the covenant. And so that word, looking at those other two mentions of the word ark, we get that it's a, a container, basically, a, a, something to carry something in, not necessarily something with a lid. Uh, well, let's, let's kind of go through it. I want to talk about what it looks like, uh, what its purpose was, what it did in the Old Testament, or what it symbolized in the Old Testament, uh, where it is today, what, what may have replaced that uh, in the New Testament. So Exodus 25, look down at verse 10. We'll kind of go through it a little bit in and, and, uh, and the description of it and see what it looks like. Verse 10 there in Exodus 25, And they shall make an ark of shittim wood, two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. So a cubit is typically from fingertip to elbow, so about 18 inches. So that would mean that this, this uh, box or container is about 45 inches by 27 by 27. It's four foot by two by two, more or less. Uh, in verse 11, And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, within and without shalt thou overlay it, and shalt make upon it a crown of gold round about it. So it's going to be covered completely with gold within and without. Verse 12, And thou shalt cast four rings of gold for it, and put them in the four corners thereof, and two rings shall be in one side of it, and two rings on the other side of it. And thou shalt make staves of shittim wood, and overlay them with gold. And thou shalt put the staves into the rings by the sides of the ark, that the ark may be borne with them. So the, the rings are just pure gold rings on the side of the ark, and then these, these staves or poles are to be made to carry it. These are also overlaid with gold. Verse 15, the staves shall be in the rings of the ark, they shall not be taken from it. And thou shalt put into the ark the testimony which I shall give thee, and thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold, two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. So this mercy seat is essentially going to be the lid that will cover the rest of the ark, and it's the same size, 45 inches by 25, 27 inches. And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold, of beaten work shalt thou make them, and the two ends of the mercy seat, and make one cherub on the one end, and the other cherub on the other end, even of the mercy sheet, seat shall ye make the cherubims on the two ends thereof. And the cherubims shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and their faces shall look one to another. Toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubims be. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark. So these cherubims or angels figures are going to be with their wings spread over, looking towards each other and down at the mercy seat. So if it's a, you imagine a rectangular box that's the, that's the ark itself, and the cherubim are to be looking towards the mercy seat, and that's the lid that would go on the ark. Um, <clears throat> where did they put it? So that's what it looks like. It's this gold covered within and without, all pure gold, uh, a wooden structure covered with pure gold. So where did they put it? <clears throat> go over to Exodus 26. Exodus 26 and down at verse 33. So Exodus 25, this is when God is explaining to Moses what he wants him to build. He's explaining how it's to look, how it's to be, what size it's to be, how they're supposed to carry it, where they're to put it in verse 26. Verse 30, uh, chapter 26. In verse 33, look down, it says, And thou shalt hang up the veil under the tatches, uh, the rings, this is to separate the holy place to the most holy place, that thou mayest bring in thither within the veil the ark of the testimony, the ark. And the veil shall divide unto you between the holy place and the most holy. And thou shalt put the mercy seat upon the ark in, of the testimony, in the most holy place. So this was to be uh, in the most holy place in the tabernacle while the children of Israel in Egypt, or uh, in the wilderness, excuse me, going to the promised land. Uh, if you want to turn to Exodus chapter 40, actually in Exodus 37, I'll just read for you, uh, is when these were actually made. Uh, it says in verse 1, And Bezalel made the ark of shittim wood, two cubits and a half was the length of it, and a cubit and a half the breadth of it, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. And it goes on to go through exactly how God wanted it made back in Exodus 26. So they made it in Exodus 37 and 38 is when they were putting everything together. And in Exodus 40 it says in verse 1, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, On the first day of the first month, 
shalt thou set up the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation, and thou shalt put therein the ark of the testimony, and cover the ark with the veil. Skip down to verse 17. And it came to pass in the first month of the second year, on the first day of the month, that the tabernacle was reared up. And Moses reared up the tabernacle, and fashioned the sockets, and set the boards thereof, and put in the bars thereof, and reared up his pillars. And he spread abroad the tent over the tabernacle, and put the covering of the tent upon it, as the Lord commanded Moses. And he took and put the testimony into the ark, and set the staves on the ark, and put the mercy seat above upon the ark. And he brought the ark into the tabernacle, and set the veil of the covering, and covered the ark of the testimony, as the Lord commanded Moses. So we see that as God wanted him to do and commanded in chapters 26 and 25, so he did. They built it, they brought it into the, taber into the uh, holy, the most holy place within the tabernacle. So we know what it looked like. It was this gold box. If you've seen any pictures, it's, it's a highly sought after artifact uh, for its monetary value and historical value and everything else. Any picture that you've seen is the Bible gives a very good description of it. That's probably pretty close to what it looked like, size-wise and gold and everything else. And we know where it was supposed to be. It was supposed to be in the most holy place. So what was it for? Flip back to Exodus 25. We see it throughout the Old Testament quite a few times it's mentioned. And we'll just kind of trace through this and kind of get a good feeling for uh, what the ark did or, or uh, was a symbol of in the Old Testament. So in Exodus 25, look down at verse 21. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark, and in the ark shalt thou put the testimony that I shall give thee. And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim which are upon the ark, the testimony of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. So it was a place that the children of Israel, or the, specifically the high priests, could come and meet and commune with God. It was a place where they could uh, seek uh, counsel at God or, or inquire of the Lord. Okay. Uh, well, this mercy seat, it talks about that here in this chapter. Uh, if you want to flip to Leviticus chapter 16, we'll kind of see what the mercy seat was for. Leviticus chapter 16, again, this was the high priest that was to have access to this most holy place. Uh, Leviticus 16, this is the, the story of the, the scapegoat. So Aaron's picking two goats. One's going to be a sacrifice, the other one's going to be the scapegoat. Uh, let's go to... Uh, verse 14. So there's actually a, a bullock or a young bull calf that is, that is to be sacrificed in addition to this goat of the sin offering. Verse 14 it says, And he shall take the blood of the bullock, so they're to kill this young bull, and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward. And before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle the blood with his finger seven times. Verse 15, Then shall he kill the goat, so this is the, not the scapegoat, the other goat, shall he kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring his blood within the veil and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat and he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions in all their sins so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanness. So this, this sprinkling of the blood of this goat and of this bullock were uh, a symbol of Christ's blood going to be shed for us, right? This is the cleansing of the blood. The Bible tells us that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin, right? So this is the picture of, uh, you know, the blood that's going to be shed by the Christ, by the Messiah. Uh, and this was to do, to make atonement for the holy place because of their transgression of the children of Israel. So it's a representative to them. It's, it's to... This mercy seat specifically on top of the ark, that was where that sacrifice was pictured, where it was made. So what was in the ark? The ark the, the, one of the passages we just read talks about that. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 10. So we know what it looks like. We know where it was supposed to be kept. Uh, we know what it was for, right? It was to, to meet and to commune with, the, with God for the children of Israel or the high priest. I uh, had the mercy seat, so it was a place of atonement. But what was in it? So inside the ark in Deuteronomy chapter 10, look down at verse 1. At that time the Lord said unto me, Hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first, and come up unto me in the mount, and make thee an ark of wood. So the, obviously Moses got the first two tables, and he threw them down when he saw the golden calf, when he came back down, and so these are the second time. And I will write on the tables the words that were in the first tables which thou breakest, and thou shalt put them in the ark. And it goes on, and I made an ark of shittim wood, and hewed two tables of stone like unto the first, and went up into the mount, having the two tables in mine hand. And he wrote on the tables, according to the first writing, the Ten Commandments, which the Lord spake unto you in the mount in the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. And the Lord gave them unto me. 
And I turned myself and came down from the mountain, put the tables in the ark which I had made, and there they be, as the Lord commanded me. So we see that, that Moses listened to God, and he, he took these two ta uh, tables of stone, the Ten Commandments, and put them in the ark. Okay, so also uh, flip to Deuteronomy 31. Deuteronomy 31, let me go there myself. So there was more than just the Ten Commandments in there. We see in Deuteronomy 31. Deuteronomy 31, uh, starting verse 24. And it came to pass when Moses had made an end of writing the words of the law in the book until they were finished, that Moses commanded the Levites, which bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, oh, I'm sorry, excuse me, bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, saying, Take this book of the law and put it in the side of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there for a witness against thee. So it also tells them to take a book of the law, the whole book, you know, Genesis through Deuteronomy that Moses wrote. It tells them to put that in there as well. Uh, flip to Exodus 16. Exodus 16. So there's the Ten Commandments and the books of the law. There's a couple other things in there, and we also see this mentioned again in Hebrews, and we'll get to that in a, in a, in a few minutes. But in Exodus 16, we see one other thing that was in the ark. Uh, look down at verse 31. And the house of Israel was called... Oh, excuse me. And the house of Israel called the name thereof manna. So this is when the Israelites were in the desert. God's feeding them from heaven. Manna fell from heaven. He outlines how much they're supposed to gather, when they're supposed to gather it, what to do about the Sabbath day. He outlines all these principles for them. And the house of Israel called the name thereof manna. And it was like coriander seed, white, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. And Moses said, This is the thing which the Lord commandeth. Fill an omer of it to be kept for your generations, that they may see the bread wherewith I have fed you in the wilderness when I brought you forth from the land of Egypt. And Moses said unto Aaron, Take a pot, and put an omer full of manna therein, and lay it up before the Lord to be kept for your generations. As the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron laid it up before the testimony to be kept. Okay, so we see that there's the Ten Commandments along with the Book of the Law. We also see that there's a jar of manna, and Hebrews, Hebrews 9 confirms this as well. Turn also to Numbers 17. There's actually one more thing in the ark. Number 17, uh, this is after uh, Korah, uh, the, the dispute between Korah and Moses and Aaron and everything, and Korah was swallowed up by the earth. This is, takes place right after that. Number 17, uh, verse 1, this is Aaron's rod that budded is also the fourth thing that's in the ark. And we'll read that story just to get a, a feel for what that uh, means or symbolizes. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and take of every one of them a rod according to the houses of their fathers, of all their princes, according to the house of their fathers, twelve rods, and write thou every man's name upon his rod. And thou shalt write Aaron's name upon the rod of Levi, for one rod shall be for the head of their house of their fathers. And thou shalt lay them up in the tabernacle of the congregation before the testimony, where I will meet with you. And it shall come to pass that the man's rod, whom I shall choose, shall blossom. And I'll make to cease for me the murmurings of the children of Israel, whereby they murmur against you. So if you remember Korah, there was... There was uh, a revolt or a reviling, right? There were contentions content uh, from Korah and his group with Moses and Aaron. And so this is the way that God's going to show who he's choosing, what, you know, who's going to be uh, after this whole deal with Korah happened. Uh, verse 6, And Moses spake unto the children of Israel, and every one of their princes gave him a rod apiece, each, for each prince one, according to their father's houses, even twelve rods, and the rod of Aaron was among their rods, and Moses laid up the rods before the Lord in the tabernacle of the witness. And it came to pass that on the morrow Moses went into the tabernacle of witness, and behold, the rod of Aaron for the house of Levi was budded, and brought forth buds and bloomed blossoms, and yielded almonds. And Moses brought out the rods from before the Lord unto all the children of Israel, and they looked and took every man his rod, and the Lord said unto Moses, Bring Aaron's rod again before the testimony, to be kept for a token against the rebels. So he says it, it should be kept for a token against the rebels. And thou shalt quite take away their murmurings from me, that they die not. And, and Moses did so, as the Lord commanded him, so did he. So we see that Aaron's rod that budded, you know, these are just sticks that they chose for each man. Aaron's rod that budded was the one who God chose. God chose Aaron at this time. And this was to kept, be kept for a token against the rebels, that they take away their murmurings from me. Okay, so we'll keep that in mind. I'll just read for you Hebrews 9. It also talks about this as one of the New Testament, about the only New Testament mention of the ark. Uh, Hebrews 9, 4 says, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, 
wherein was the golden pot that had manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. So we see in the New Testament it referencing three of these things that were in the ark. So this is getting a little tedious, and, uh, but I, uh, it's important for the second half of this, so I, I want to make sure we understand yes, what it looked like. You know, We get the idea on that, where it was supposed to be kept in the most holy place. Uh, what it was for, it was to be used for a place to meet and to commune with God, especially for the high priest. It was a place to make atonement for the sins of the nation. Uh, and it had things in it. It had the Ten Commandments in it. It had the books of the law. It had uh, the, the jar of manna. And it had Aaron's rod that budded. So what was it for? What did it do in the Old Testament? Or what uh, did it help to do in the Old Testament? Uh, turn to Joshua chapter 3. So there's a couple things that it did. And we'll kind of look at a few of those here. Joshua chapter 3, we've just been going through in, in the Wednesday night series. Joshua chapter 3, and this is uh, at the beginning when they're getting ready to cross into the promised land. And that's one thing that the ark did, is it helped to lead them into the promised land, to cross Jordan River. Uh, verse 1 of Joshua 3, And Joshua rose early in the morning, and they removed from Shittim, and came to Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and lodged there before they passed over. And it came to pass after three days that the officers went through the host and they commanded the people saying, When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, then shall you remove from your places and go after it. So they're, so they're to use this as a, as a thing to follow, right? When they get up and leave, they're, they're to follow it. Yet there shall be space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure. Come not near unto it that you may know the way by which you must go, for you have not passed this way heretofore. So it's going to lead them in this, in this strange area that they haven't been to before. So they're to follow it and leave some space. Uh, flip down to verse 14, please. Um, and it came to pass, when the people removed from their tents to pass over Jordan, and the priest bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people. And as soon as they that bear the Ark were coming to Jordan, and the feet of the priest that bear the Ark were dipped into the brim of the water, for the Jordan overfloweth all its banks uh, all the time of harvest, that the waters which came down from above stood up, stood and rose up upon a heap very far from the city of Adam. That is beside Zedaran, and those that came down toward the sea of the plain, even the salt sea, failed and were cut off. And the people passed over right against Jericho. So as soon as they entered into the river, the river stopped flowing. It's dammed up above and, and it stops. And they pass over on dry ground. In verse 17 it says, And the priests that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord stirred, stirred stood firm on dry ground in the midst of Jordan. And all the Israelites passed over on dry ground until all the people were passed clean over Jordan. So the ark was used as a, as a, a leader to go into the promised land. It went into the sea first, or to the uh, Jordan River first. The river dried up and the people were able to pass, pass through on dry ground. So it helped to lead them into the promised land. Uh, in the old, uh, before they were into the promised land, actually in Numbers 10, I'll just read this one for you. Uh, it led them through the wilderness. In verse 33 it says, And they departed from the mount of the Lord three days' journey from Sinai. And the ark of the covenant of the Lord went before them in three days' journey to search out a resting place for them. So it was to, where it, where it was moving, they would move. And when it stopped, they would stop. And that's, that's how they were kind of led throughout the wilderness uh, in that time before they came to the Jordan River. So it brought them into the promised land, crossed the Jordan River. It led them through the wilderness beforehand. Uh, flip over to jo Joshua 6, if you're there in Joshua 3. Joshua 6, I'll, I'll, we also just talked about this one too. Uh, verse 11, it helped them fight battles. So the ark was uh, instrumental in helping fight battles or leading in, in these battles. So this is the uh, story of Jericho, the walls falling. Uh, just kind of a, a good verse on this, verse 11. So the ark of the Lord compassed the city, going about it once. And they came into the camp and lodged in the camp. And Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priests took up the ark of the Lord. And seven priests, bearing seven trumpets of ram's horn, before the ark went on continually, and blew with the trumpets, and the armed men went before them. But the rear ward came after the ark of the Lord, the priests going on and blowing with the trumpets. And so this happened uh, through the different days and, and the different patterns that they were supposed to do, and eventually uh, it culminated with the walls falling down. But the ark was instrumental in leading this parade or this march around the city. So it helped fight these battles. Um, flip to Judges chapter 20. Judges chapter 20. This is after the Judges 19 incident and uh, the children of Israel are fighting with uh, the tribe of Benjamin and they're, uh, they fought twice with them and they've lost both times and they're trying to figure out if they should continue and go again. Uh, Judges chapter 20 and verse 26. Then all the children of the Lord and all the people went up and came into the house of God and wept and sat there before the Lord and fasted that day until even and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. 
And the children of Israel inquired of the Lord, for the ark of the covenant was there in those days. And Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, stood before it in those days, saying, Shall I yet go out to battle against the children of Benjamin, my brother, or shall I cease? And the Lord said, Go up, for tomorrow I will deliver them into mine hand. So there, this is a place to inquire of the Lord, to meet with the Lord, to, to inquire of him, to ask counsel of him. And that's what they did here. So this is another role that we see uh, the Ark of the Covenant instrumental in. They seek counsel or inquire of the Lord. So what happened to it? So we know what it looks like, what it was used for, where it was supposed to be, what was inside of it. And we know the roles that it did throughout the Old Testament. It was uh, across, into Jordan, across the Jordan into the Promised Land. It led them through battles. It led them in the wilderness. What happened to it? Uh, go to 1 Samuel chapter 4. There's a couple of things that happened to it here in 1 Samuel, and we'll kind of brief through some of these to, uh, to get an idea of what happened. And it's kind of an interesting story. Uh, 1 Samuel 4, let's look down at verse 1. I know it's a lot of Bible, but we kind of get a good feel for uh, what happened and, and these stories and why things happen. And then we'll compare that with what we see in the New Testament uh, and, and our application for our lives today. So 1 Samuel 4, look down at verse 1, it says, And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out against the Phil Philistines to battle, and pitched beside Ebenezer, and the Philistines pitched in Aphek. So this is a, the Philistines are fighting against Israel, and they say in verse 3, uh, second ha uh, And when the people were come into the camp, the elders of Israel said, Wherefore hath the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? So they're not doing... You know, they, and he says, Let us fetch the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us, that when it cometh among us, it may save us out of the hand of our enemies. So they, they realize that they're not doing very well in this battle, and they say, We need, we need the ark of God. That's going to that's gonna give us power and confidence and, and help us to win this battle. Verse 4, So the people sent to Shiloh, that they may bring from thence the ark of the covenant of the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth between the cherubim. And the two sons, Eli, Hophni, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the ark of the covenant of God. And when the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout, so that the earth rang again. They're very excited to see it. It's, it's boosting morale, and it's boosting morale of the, of the army and the soldiers. And when the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, What meaneth this noise of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews? And they understood that the Ark of the Lord was come into the camp. And this is kind of interesting. Verse 7, And the Philistines were afraid, for they said, God has come into this camp. They know they've heard about this. They've heard that this is instrumental in some of the battles that they fought at Jericho, at crossing the Red Sea. So they've seen this uh, through Israel's history here in the Promised Land and, and conquering nations and, and kingdoms and stuff. And so they, they understood this and they're afraid. And the Philistines, verse 7, were afraid, for they said, God is coming to the camp. And they said, Woe unto us, for there has not been such a thing heretofore. Woe unto us, who shall deliver us out of the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods that smote the Egyptians with all the plagues in the wilderness. They, they recognize these things. Be strong and quit yourselves like men, O you Philistines, that you be not servants unto the Hebrews, as they have been unto you. Quit yourselves like men and fight. Uh, and the Philistines, verse 10, fought, and Israel was smitten, and they fled every man into his tent. So it didn't work. And there was a very great slaughter, for there fell of Israel 30,000 footmen. So the beginning of this chapter, it was 4,000 men had died. And then they bring out the ark, thinking it's going to give them power, and they're going to, they can't lose now. They have the ark of God there. Well, the Philistines fought, and they slew another 30,000 people. So it was a huge loss for Israel. And in verse 11, it says, And the ark of God was taken, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas were slain. So at the end of this, even though they brought it out, this was their, like in chess, right? You bring out the queen, and she's going to conquer everything. She can move everywhere. Well, they thought that the ark of God was that powerful for them, but it, it didn't, in this case, they didn't have God's blessing behind what they were doing, and the ark actually ended up getting taken. Uh, 1 Samuel 5, skip down to ver uh, chapter 5, and, and we'll look at verse 1. And the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer unto Ashdod. And this is kind of an interesting story, and, and again, this is a good bit of Bible. We're just going to kind of read through and, and, uh, and get a feel for this story and what really happened. When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon, their false god. And when they of Ashdod rose early on the morrow, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. And they took Dagon and set him in his place again. And they thought, oh, something must have knocked him over. Maybe a strong breeze or something happened. And when they arose early on the morrow morning, behold, Dagon was, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. But this time, and the head of Dagon and both palms of his hands were cut off upon the threshold. Only the stump of Dagon was left. Therefore, neither the priests of Dagon nor any that come into Dagon's house 
tread on the threshold of Dagon and Ashdod unto this day. So they, they kind of started recognizing here that there's false god, they put it in there, right? It's a, it's a religious artifact to them, and so they put it in with their temple of, of other things, and false god Dagon, and it knocks over. And then his hands and head get knocked over after they set him up. So they're, now they realize something's up with this, so they don't go into that room anymore. Uh, but the hand of the Lord was heavy upon them of Ashdod, and he destroyed them and smote them with emeralds, even Ashdod and the coast thereof. And Pastor had mentioned this earlier about the emeralds. This was the curse. Uh, we can look up what that means. Um, verse 7, And when the men of Ashdod saw that it was so, they said, The ark of God of Israel shall not abide with us, for his hand is sore upon us and upon Dagon our God. So they're, they don't like it here at Ashdod. They sent therefore and gathered all the lords of the Philistines together and said, What shall we do with the ark of God of Israel? And they answered, Let the ark of God be carried away unto Gath. So they're kind of playing hot potato with the Ark of the Covenant. They don't want it near them because it's causing them trouble. They're having pain and these sores and, and these uh, emeralds. And uh, so they send it to Gath and they carried the Ark of God of Israel out thither. And it was so that after they carried it about, the hand of the Lord was against the city with a very great destruction. And he smote the men of the city, both small and great, and they had emeralds in their secret parts. Therefore they sent the Ark of God to Ekron. So now from Gath, it goes to Ekron. They keep sending it around at the different heads of the kings of, of uh, the Philistines. And it came to pass, that as the ark of God came to Ekron, that the Ekronites cried out, saying, They have brought the ark of the God of Israel to us, to slay us and our people. They know what's going on. They don't like it here. They're, like they're saying, they're playing hot potato with it. They want, they want it out of here. Verse 11, So they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, Send away the ark of God of Israel and let it go again to his own place. So they get everybody together and they say, what should we do with this thing? Oh, let's, let's give it back to the Israelites. We don't want this thing here anymore. That it slay us not and our people, for there was a deadly destruction throughout all the city, and the hand of God was very heavy there. And the men that had died, that died not, were smitten with emeralds, and the cry of the city went up to heaven. So they don't want it here. They're, they decide to send it back. Uh, skip down to verse, uh, 1 Samuel 6, the next chapter. And the ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines seven months. Okay, so it's there seven months, and they're bouncing it around to these different regions in the, in the Philistine uh, area. And so what they do is they end up talking, and how do, how do we get this back? And they say, well, let's build a cart, and we'll put it on the cart, and we'll get two milk cows, and we'll put them on, and we'll take their calves and put them on the side, and we'll just make sure that they go straight towards Israel. We'll send it this way, and we'll watch where they go and, and see what happens. You know, he, he knows that they, this area knows that it's causing destruction in their region, in their town, and they want to get rid of it, and they want to send it back to, back to Israel. Uh, verse 7 of 1 Samuel 6, Now therefore make a new cart, and take two milk kine, and on which hath, there hath come no yoke, and tie the kine to the cart, and bring their calves home from them. And take the ark of the Lord, and lay it upon the cart, and put the jewels of gold, which ye return him for a trespass, trespass offering, and a coffer by the side thereof, and send it away, that it may go. So they're uh, putting, they actually make images of these golden emeralds and of these mice and different things, and they're trying to put it as a, as a sacrifice offering to lay with the ark as they're sending it back, kind of a way that they're, they're trying to apologize and seek uh, reparation and get, get this plague that's in their nation out of there. Uh, verse 10, And the men did so, and took two milk kine, and tied them to the cart, and shut up their calves at home. And they laid the ark of the Lord upon the cart, and the coffer with the mice of gold and the images of their emeralds. Uh, and, they, and the kind took the straight way of Beth Shemosh and went along the highway, lowing as they went, and turned not aside to the right or to the left. And the lords of the Philistines went after them under the border of Beth Shemosh. So they're actually watching to make sure that it's going the right direction. They don't want it boomeranging back into their camp and causing more problems. So it goes into Beth Shemosh, and down in verse 16 it says, And when the five lords of the Philistines had seen it, they returned to Ekron the same day. So they see it get into the into this Beth Shemosh, uh, and okay, it's out of our hair, it's out of our hands, let's come back home. Uh, 1 Samuel 7, uh, down in verse 2, it says, And it came to pass, while the ark abode in kirjath Jerem, that time was long, for it was twenty years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. So, uh, it, was, it crossed into the Promised Land, they fought, it was used to fight battles. When they were fighting against the Philistines, it was taken, and it was gone for seven months. And after those seven months, the Philistines sent it back to them with all these uh, uh, golden offerings for a trespass offering against, you know, having taken it. And then once they got it back, it was, it was in kirjath Jerem for 20 years. Uh, king Saul, actually, when he's king, he, he inquires of the ark, he wants to bring it there for, a, for a, uh, something to inquire of the Lord or to seek counsel of God. Uh, but turn to 2 Samuel 6. 
So we see also that once uh, David builds the temple, uh, he wants to bring it up and, and put it in, or I'm, excuse, excuse me, not David built the temple. David wants to bring it into the tabernacle. He wants to keep it from, you know, bring it up from, from uh, Bethshemoth and Kirjath Jerem, and he wants to bring it up so they have it near him. Uh, for 2 Samuel 6 and verse 1. Again, David gathered together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000, and David arose and went with all the people that were with him of Baal of Judah, from Baal of Judah to bring up from thence the ark of God, whose name is called by the Lord, the name of the Lord of hosts that dwelleth between the cherubim. So he wants to bring it up into the, into the midst of them. And they set the, God, the ark of God upon a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab that was in Gibeah. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, drave the cart. So they don't carry it the way that God intended it to be carried. They don't carry it like he outlined in uh, Exodus 25. He, they put it on a new cart. They mimic what the Philistines had done. You know, they put it on a cart and they sent it with the cows. And so David does the same thing. He does it wrong. He doesn't carry it correctly. And uh, let's see. In verse 4, And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which is a Gibeah accompanying the ark of God. And Ahio went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord in all manner of instruments made of fir wood, even on harps and on psalteries and on timbrels and on cornets and on cymbals. And when they came to Nashon's threshing floor, Uzzah put his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it for the oxen shook it. So again, it's on this cart. It's not being carried the way it's intended. And it's about to fall. And so Uzzah braces it to catch it. And God is angered with him and he kills him. He didn't do it properly. Okay, and we'll, we'll kind of get to this in, in the uh, next part here. And David was displeased, and it says in verse 9, And David was afraid of the Lord that day, and he said, How shall the ark of the Lord come to me? Uh, and First Chronicles 13 and through 15, it kind of goes through this a little bit more. He, he inquires with other people how it's supposed to be carried, and then he actually carries it the correct way. Uh, and we see uh, in verse 13, It was so that when they that bear the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed oxes and fatlings. So he's so happy now that they were doing it correctly, that he was, he was doing sacrifices every six yards or so. And verse 17, it says, And they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in his place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. So David brings it into this tabernacle that he has now that he's king. Uh, and keeps it, you know, it was in Kirjath Jerem. He brings it into this uh, tabernacle that he has. In 1 Kings chapter 8, if you want to turn there, uh, we see Solomon. And this is kind of the last uh, resting place that we see of the ark uh, in, in the Old Testament. Uh, 1 Kings 8, uh, verse 6, it says, And the priest brought in the ark of the covenant of the Lord into its place, into the oracle of the house, to the most holy place, even under, wing, under the wings of the cherubim. So this is after Solomon has finally built the temple that replaced the tabernacle. David, of course, wanted to build the temple. God said no, so he saved up uh, money and, and, and goods and, and uh, use, uh, things to use to build the, tab the temple. Solomon builds it, and he brings the Ark of the Covenant into this most holy place of the temple. So that's kind of a brief history on where it was throughout the Old Testament. It, you know, they had it in Israel. They crossed through uh, the Promised Land with it. It helped them to fight battles. They were fighting a battle. They brought it out. The Philistines took it for seven months, and they bring it back, and eventually it makes it into the Temple of Solomon. Um, where is it at now? Uh, turn to Jeremiah 3. Where is it at now? Like I said in 1 Kings 8, that's kind of the last mention that we see where it's at. Um, we don't know where it's at today. Uh, the Bible actually tell, seems to say here, uh, we'll see here and also in Hebrews 9, that um, it's not uh, an important thing anymore. It was a picture of the sacrifice of Christ being sprinkled on this mercy seat. That was a place to make atonement for it. Um, there's a lot of movies and books and different things written about the Ark of the Covenant. It's this art, uh, great artifact. Archaeologists are looking for it, all this and that. Um, and we don't know. Maybe it'll be something used in the end time events. Maybe it'll be something done in the future. But the Bible doesn't really say explicitly where it is now. In Jeremiah 3, uh, look down at verse uh, 14. Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you, and I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion. And I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. And it shall come to pass, when you be multiplied and increased in the land, in those days, saith the Lord, they shall say no more, the ark of the covenant of the Lord. Neither shall it come to mind, neither shall they remember it, neither shall they visit it, neither shall that be done anymore. So talking about the ark of the covenant, you know, in that day, when, when you be multiplied and increased in the land, when, when he will bring us to Zion. 
uh, it won't be something that we it won't be something that's done anymore. It's not part of the tradition anymore. It's it's kind of prophesying here. Uh, flip to Hebrews chapter nine, and we'll kind of see that teased out a little bit more. Let me go there myself. Hebrews chapter 9, uh, let's see, let's look at verse 1. There, then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made first, wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary, talking about the tabernacle originally made, obviously. And the, after the veil, after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, or the most holy place. Uh, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, manna Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. And over it the, uh, the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat, seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. So that, that last part of verse 5 there, of which we cannot now speak particularly, is referencing the Ark. I believe that's kind of saying, like at that time, they don't, we can't speak of it. We don't know where it is. You know, um, this is in Hebrews. This is in the New Testament, obviously. Maybe it was lost sometime uh, in the captivity of Babylon or with Hezekiah when the Assyrians came or when the Babylonians came. The Bible doesn't really say, but based on Jeremiah 3 and on Hebrews uh, 9, 5, I'm kind of thinking that it's not around at this point. Um, that's my thought and based on seeing this. But uh, look down at verse 23, also Hebrews 9 there. Verse 23. It says here, it was therefore necessary that the patterns of the things in the heavens should be purified with these. Talking about the blood of the blood of bulls and of goats. So it was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens. So the, the earthly vessels, like the tabernacle, the table, the show, you know, the mercy seat, the ark, they were patterns of the things in heaven. So God was describing in Exodus 25 what he wanted Moses to make and how it was to be made, what it was to look like, how they were to move it, everything. He was very explicit about that. And Hebrews 9 here seems to say that these are patterned after something in heaven. Um, so it was therefore necessary that the patterns of the things in heavens, in the heavens, excuse me, should be purified with these, talking about the bloods of the bullocks and the goats, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Okay, this is talking about the, the pattern of the things in heaven, the actual things in heaven, with better sacrifices, the blood of Christ. Right? It, this chapter is talking about the blood of bulls and goats can't take away sin. It was a picture of Christ shedding his blood. Uh, verse 24, for Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands. Talking about he, went, he actually went to heaven. He ascended up to heaven to, to, to sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat there, which are the figures of the true. So the things... The holy places made with hands are the figures of the true, the actual ones. But into heaven itself is where Christ entered, now to appear in the presence of God for us, you know, as an atonement for us. So this is when Christ uh, rose again and, and went to heaven momentarily and then came back to, to dwell among us for a couple months or years. So we see kind of this history of the ark, what it was used, where it went through, got lost uh, to the Philistines for seven months, came back, what it had in it. Uh, and that it was a picture of something in heaven. So what does it mean for us? Okay, this is all the Old Testament stuff. And now focusing on our application for it, what do we see in the New Testament that takes this place? Well, the Old Testament ark was a picture of God's presence with the Israelites. And we don't have a tabernacle. This isn't, there isn't a most holy place where somebody goes in and kills a goat and sheds its blood somewhere. You know, we don't, those, those things were nailed to the cross. But we now have the Holy Spirit, right? Uh, turn to Ephesians 1, verse 13. This is a very famous passage that I'm sure we all know. Now we have the Holy Spirit, the, the, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Once we're saved, this is by who we're sealed. Ephesians 1, 13. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. Okay, the Holy Ghost, uh, in Acts 5, I'll just read, this is with Ananias and Sapphira, they lied, and, and Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? Later he says, thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. So we know the Holy Ghost, the Trinity, right? The Holy Ghost is God, and we have that with us. We're, we're sealed by that, with the Holy Spirit, right, once we believe. Um, 1 Corinthians 6, if you want to turn there, please. 
1 Corinthians 6. So the Old Testament ark, it was this beautiful golden uh, vessel that contained things. It was where uh, they made the sacrifices, but it was this beautiful golden uh, vessel. 1 Corinthians 6, look at verse 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Okay, the ark was this beautiful thing, and it was to symbolize that, you know, God's presence with them. And, and our bodies, the Bible says, is, you know, if we're saved, we're temples of the Holy Ghost. So we ought to treat our bodies in ways that, you know, bring glory to God and bring, bring honor to the Holy Ghost that's in us. Um, so what, is, what does the Holy Ghost do for us? Um, what, is the ark, what did the ark do in the Old Testament? Well, it teaches them. It led them, led them through the wilderness. Turn to 1 Corinthians 2, just, just a couple chapters before that. So it actually teaches us. So this is comparing and contrasting the ark with the Holy Spirit that we have now in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 9, it says, But as, as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the hearts of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. So the Spirit is what leads us, right? It, it helps bring us to bring to remembrance things that we've read in the Bible, things that we've heard from preaching. It's that uh, we have our conscience, but it's more than that. It's the Holy Spirit within us. Um, and that's what teaches us and leads us. Um, so in the Old Testament, they had the ark. It led them through the wilderness. The Holy Spirit leads us if we're, if we're using it correctly and feeding it correctly. Uh, it also, in the Old Testament, the ark was used to fight battles, right? The Battle of Jericho. In Luke 12, Look, uh, flip down to Luke 12. Excuse me, I should have said that. Go over to Luke chapter 12. We also see that the Holy Spirit helps us to fight battles. Luke chapter 12, verse 11, it says, And when they bring you unto the synagogues, and unto magistrates and powers, and take ye, take ye no thought how or what thing ye shall answer, or what ye shall say. For the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what you ought to say. This could be at the point of martyrdom for us, right? We could be getting ready at this point, if they bring us up before, and you know, to be, to be killed. And we see that with some of the stories uh, told from the martyr's mirror that, you know, the Holy Ghost is speaking through them. And that's a promise that God gives us that the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what you shall say. So it's going to help us fight those battles, the Holy Ghost, or the Spirit, you know, the, the Holy Spirit. So in the Old Testament, they would go to the ark to seek counsel with God. It was a place to meet with God and to commune with God. Uh, turn to John chapter 14. We see that also with the Holy Spirit. It's a place to seek counsel with God, to learn from God. John chapter 14, is Jesus speaking here, telling of future things to come? And verse uh, 26, it says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, <clears throat> to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. So it, again, it's going to uh, counsel us in our lives and give us direction and, and teach us where we should go. When we hear preaching, we can read it with the Bible and, and our, on our spirit, the Holy Spirit within us can witness with ourselves and, and show us where we should go. Now, how can we maximize the effectiveness of, of the Holy Spirit, right? Um, grieve not the Spirit, right? It's possible to grieve the Holy Spirit if we're living, within sin, living in sin or, or not doing what God wants us to do. But this verse, uh, John 14, it says, bring all things to your remembrance. The Bible tells us that the Holy Ghost won't speak of itself, but it brings things to our remembrance. So if we're not reading our Bible, if we're not uh, listening to preaching and, and, and studying the things of God and, and praying and reading, our, reading the Bible daily, uh, it has nothing to bring into remembrance. So we need to be, in a sense, feeding it or keeping things in our body and in our, you know, in our uh, habits, having good habits that would allow the Holy Spirit to teach us and to bring things to remembrance. Um, now the Old Testament had the, the, Old, the Old Testament ark. Remember it had three or four things in it. It had the Ten Commandments, it had the books of the law, it had uh, Aaron's rod that budded, and it had the manna. So how can we maximize the Holy Spirit that we have now in the New Testament once we're saved? Well, the Old Testament ark had the law and the commandments, right? Psalm 119, verse 11 says, Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against you. Right? God tells us he wants us to memorize and me meditate on Scripture so that we might not sin against you. Right. If you remember in the Old Testament, they were to put the tables of stone in the ark, and they were to be a witness against thee, it said. So 
to, to show them their sin, to show them what's right and wrong, to convict them and keep them humble and keep them in that right mindset that they might not sin against thee. Uh, in the Old Testament, it had the, the pot of manna. Well, manna was the bread sent from heaven to sustain them in the wilderness. So we see that God was taking care of them, so that's a picture of that. We have the Holy Ghost now, so we see that God will, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, right? The Bible tells us. But more than that, Jesus said in John 6, 48, I am that bread of life. In verse 51, he says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I give, I will give for the life of the world. Okay, so Jesus is, was a, the manna was a picture of Christ, right? And you could take something away from the manna, the bread of life, talking about the word of God. Jesus was the word. And the manna they were to collect daily, and that's something as well with the, having the law in the Old Testament ark, that we should be reading the Bible daily, also in the manna, you see, okay? <laughs> so the law, we should have God's word in our lives and be feeding the Holy Ghost with, by reading the Bible. Uh, the manna, uh, we should be walking with Jesus, right? He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. We should be continually trying to sharpen our, our Christian law, uh, walk as we're going through life. The, last, the other thing that was in there was Aaron's rod that budded. Okay, he was the chosen priest. 1 Peter 2, if you want to turn there, please. 1 Peter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. Uh, look down at verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but now are the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. In the same way that Aaron's rod that budded was, was uh, uh, to be in remembrance against the, uh, the revolters or against the people that would murmur, we can remember here that, look, we are a chosen generation. We are the royal priesthood now. If we're saved, we are kings and priests, the priesthood of the believer. Amen. And we're to be a peculiar people. We have a, a big job to do, right? We're to witness to go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, right? Everybody. And that's a big job to do, and we need to remember that we're chosen for that job once we're saved. And so, in the same way that the Old Testament ark had these three or four things in it, you know, we should make sure that as the New Testament that we have, we can see the, the picture of that in the New Testament uh, Holy Spirit, and the dwelling of the Holy Spirit. And we need to make sure that we have those things in our lives as well. That was the picture of it in the Old Testament, translated to the New. Amen. Now, uh, turn to 1 Kings chapter 8. 1 Kings chapter 8. So, when it was gone in the Philistines, when the Philistines took the Ark of the Lord, 1 Kings chapter 8, there were actually a couple things that were taken out of the Ark at some point. And we can assume that it was probably during the Philistines when they had it. 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 9. Remember in Hebrews it said that there were the Ten Commandments, the um, pot of manna, and Aaron's rod that budded. Well, in 1 Kings chapter 8, and verse 9, right after they bring it into the, to Solomon's temple, it says, There was nothing in the ark save the two tables of stone, which Moses put there at Horeb, when the Lord had made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. So somewhere along the lines, and assuming that it happened when it was at the Philistines, some of these items were lost. Well, what was lost? Well, the law, the books of the law. They had the Ten Commandments still there, which is good, but the books of the law were not there anymore. What is the law? The, no the law is the knowledge and the fear of God, right? That's how we know what the fear of the Lord is. That's how we know how to do these things. Uh, the law was also, remember, to be uh, something to memorize and, and to have in our heart so that we might not sin against God, to keep us in the proper perspective of what sin is and what, uh, what God wants and, and desires for us. Also the law, and we could take this kind of from if the Philistines were the ones that removed these items, uh, Satan, Satan, he's constantly trying to have different Bible versions and changing and corrupting God's word, right? We see that as early back in, in uh, the Corinthians. It says, for we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. So even at that time, there was already this process of trying to corrupt God's word. So that's why, you know, we need to be vigilant against these different versions and perversions of the Bible. Um, Aaron's rod was removed. So we have the law that was taken, and so Satan's attack on that, on maybe just us, not reading our Bible daily. Maybe us just not memorizing certain scriptures or not, not taking the time to do that. Or Satan's attack on the Word of God in general. Aaron's rod that budded was, was, uh, was taken. Again, remember Aaron's rod. This is a reminder that we are, the chosen, we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. We have a, we have a great job to do. 
Okay, and this was also a reminder for the people to keep the, uh, the, the rebels from murmuring, like the, the Korah did. Okay, and so if we don't have this in our life now, if we're not remembering and keeping in remembrance that we are that chosen generation now that we're saved, uh, the Satan can get us to not maybe preach the gospel. Well, you know, we, we meet people out soul winning all the time that are saved, but they're not doing anything. They, they don't, oh, there's many paths to Jesus. Even one talked today with Brother Phil and I, that, and she's saved, and she says these things, but Satan's convinced her that, well, you know, uh, there's, there's a lot of different opinions out there, and I know what I believe, but she's not being effective for anybody, right? She's not doing any, what at the profit, James talks about, right? Uh, it's, it's not for our own profit that we do things and we go so on, it's for the profit of others. So Aaron's rod was taken out uh, in the ark, and that could show that, you know, hey, we need to make sure that there's an attack on us remembering uh, what we deserve and staying humble. We're saved, yes, amen, but we still deserve hell for, for our sins, right? Other people out there still deserve hell. We can get, it can get monotonous sometimes going soul winning and, and it goes through time and we don't get salvation. It could be month, or two months, three months where we don't see a salvation. But we need to make sure that we always keep that attitude that look, every person is a soul, every person. We have that, you know, we talk, tell soul winning stories and uh, you know, it touches us when somebody just truly gets it. And, and uh, I know I've had that too when you, you reach somebody at the door and maybe it's just a bridge too far. They're not ready to make that decision. They fully understand it. They get it. They understand the consequences of not believing, but they're maybe just not quite ready to trust on that. And it's a, and it's a humbling experience because you know, a lot of us were in that same, very same set of shoes not that long ago. Like it was three or four years ago that I was in that same position. And it's, it's a humbling thing knowing that, okay, I know where I'm going. Let's, let's try and get as many other people to know where they're going at the same time. So Aaron's rod that butted was removed and that attack on us as a chosen generation. The manna was also taken. Okay, this is our daily Bible reading, right? Uh, they were to gather it every day. Uh, it was a picture of Christ coming down, right? If you love me, keep my commandments. So the manna was taken out, the jar of manna that was taken out. This can, you know, if, uh, this could sim or show that our, uh, in, our, in our New Testament life with the Holy Spirit, it's important that we continue to walk in, in the commandments and clean up our lives and be living our Christian life daily. Um, so what if we don't heed the Spirit's advice? 2 Corinthians 3.17, I'll just read for you. It says, Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So we have liberty as Christians, right? We're saved, we're sealed, there's nothing we could ever do to lose our salvation. We have liberty. But with that liberty comes consequences. Okay, if we're not reading our Bible, if we're not uh, memorizing Scripture, if we're not remembering our job and our duty as, as a chosen generation to, to reach the dying world with the Gospel, uh, if we're not constantly reminding ourselves of, of what the law is and our condition and others' conditions, we're not going to be effective Christians, right? The consequences are that, not for us, but for future generations, for other people out there, for the unsaved that are out there. Okay, if we're not feeding the Spirit, He can't help to feed us. If we're not reading our Bible, there's nothing for Him, the Spirit, to bring to remembrance. If we don't have anything that we're giving Him, He can't bring anything to our remembrance. So we need to be... Uh, using these like what the Old Testament Ark had in them. We need to be having those as part of our lives, or at least what they symbolize, in order to be effective as Christians. Uh, turn to John chapter 16. I'm sorry, turn, turn, turn to number six, Numbers 14. I'll just read for you John 16. Numbers chapter 14, please. We'll, we'll end here. So John chapter 16, again, like I said, uh, the, how about he, when the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. So this is, again, if we're not feeding him, if we're not giving him things to tell us, he, he doesn't speak of his own. He brings things to remember us for us. So Numbers 14. So if we, uh, this is kind of an interesting couple verses. Um, the children of Israel did something wrong. God dealt out the punishment. They had a change of heart, and they tried to do what was right. And it wasn't blessed. And I want to look at that and kind of see, so what if we don't heed the Spirit's advice? What if we don't do these certain things? And even with the ark, when they were moving the ark, uh, when David was bringing the ark back into his tabernacle, they didn't do things the right way, right? They copied the Philistines' pattern. They put it on a cart with oxen pulling it. And a man died because of it. God is very specific in the Bible. And he tells us that he wants things done a certain way, in a certain manner, in certain times. Uh, Numbers 14, look down at verse 37. So this is when uh, the, the, the ten spies went in to check out the land. 
uh, Joshua and Caleb were among them. It says in verse 37, even those men that did bring up the evil report upon the land died by the plague before the Lord. But Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were of the men that went to search the land, lived still. Uh, verse 40, and they rose up early in the morning and got them upon the top of the mount, saying, Lo, we be here and will go up to the place which the Lord hath promised, for we have sinned. So they, the punishment was dealt out because these eight people, not the two, uh, uh, Joshua and Caleb, but the other eight murmured and it caused the rest of the people to be afraid. And so the punishment was they were going to wander in the desert for 40 years and all that generation was going to die of, of a certain age and under. But now they have a change of heart. No, no, lo, we be here in the second part of verse 40. We will go up into the place the Lord hath promised, for we have sinned. So they recognize that, and they have a change of heart, and they want to do what's right. And Moses said, Wherefore now do you transgress the commandment of the Lord? But it shall not prosper. He's saying, look, you, you already sinned by being afraid and not wanting to go in the promised land initially, and now you want to sin again, even after God's dealt out his punishment, you want to go against that. It shall not prosper. Go not up, for the Lord is not among you that you be not smitten before your enemies. For the Amalekites and the Canaanites that are before you, and you shall fall by the sword. He's warning them, because you are turned away from the Lord, and therefore the Lord will not be with you. But they presumed to go up unto the hilltop. Nevertheless, the ark of the covenant of the Lord and Moses departed not out of the camp. So God, God pictured by the ark was not with them, was not behind this movement. Then the Amalekites came down, and the Canaanites which dwelt in that hill, and smote them, and discomfited them, even unto Hormah. And we need to be careful here because these people uh, received the, the judgment. They were going to wander in the, 40, in the desert for 40 years and they were going to be killed because they uh, got scared. Or they were afraid and they didn't trust God. Then they had a change of heart. No, no, okay, this time now we'll really go, right? How, how, how many times do we have that? If God tells us something, we see something clear and we get nervous and maybe we don't go. But then we, then we, then we do go after, after you know, thinking about it for a while or maybe not moving at the right time then we'd later decide to move. But it didn't profit these people. God wanted to, them to go initially, not after he chastised them. And so we need to make sure that we remember that you know, uh, we need to keep our ark or our spirit, our Holy Spirit, full. We need to be feeding it with the law, with the manna, uh, and with Aaron's rod, the butter. We need to keep those things in mind and what they, what they picture. But we also need to be, pay, be sure to pay attention to not only what God wants us to do, but also when and how. He's very particular in how he wants us to do things. And so we need to make sure that we're doing things according to his will. So this is kind of a, a, an inter, a interesting topic for me. It, it, uh, I noticed these things on it, and I hope it was an encouragement for you guys. And every time you read through the Old Testament and you see the ark, maybe it might bring these things to remembrance, and, and uh, we can apply it to our lives. So let's, uh, let's close in a word of prayer.